If your thermostat isn't sensitive enough, you might have it set at 70 degrees, but it might be like 74 before it kicks on to cool it down, or it might be like, you know, 65 before it starts to warm it up. So you see this bigger fluctuation in what can happen before the sensor kicks in and solves it. So for a lot of people that have POTS, our ability to control our thermostat is less stable. Have you had success in relieving symptoms related to heat intolerance? What is the underlying cause that creates the heat sensitivity to heat as well as fatigue following heat exposure? This is a really good question. It's, this is the time of year we're getting this one a bunch. Um, so a couple, there are a couple questions in there. So number one, can we relieve the symptoms? Number two, the underlying cause of the sensitivity to heat as well as the fatigue. Now, a lot of people will get fatigued generally in the heat. That's just the gift that is the heat. That's what, you know, picture, you know, lying on the beach. Most people aren't energized by that. But our pot spokes are people that have difficulties with different types of perfusion will be more sensitive for two reasons. Number one, if we have reflexive problems with being able to maintain enough blood flow to our heart and to our brain that it's given the symptoms, taking more of that blood flow and pulling it into the skin to manage temperature takes it out of the budget, makes it harder to be able to perfuse the brain. So that's number one. Just pushing it into the skin with heat doesn't even have to be sunlight. Um, heat Pulling that redness or that, that blood flow into the skin can make some people just feel like their battery gets drained, right? And that's pretty common. Um, so that's number one, is that we're already looking at a system where the blood flow is not managed well. By pulling it into the skin, we're just not helping the situation. It doesn't mean that that is the problem. It just means it's not going to help. It's going to make it worse because it's going to lean. It's going to exacerbate it. It's going to be a stressor. Now, the second part, is that with dis different types of dysautonomia, and it's not everybody, but to a degree, we can also see all these, these feedback loops become impaired where we're, we're getting changes in sensory afferents. So somebody might be more sensitive to their world. They might be less sensitive to their world. They might notice that their body is more reactive. They might notice that it's less reactive. But all of these things have an effect at the cerebral level where we create that, that picture of us we drive that into the paraventricular nucleus that then goes down and distributes um, some of those like energy producing systems where we're trying to, to increase energy exposure. So that's increasing metabolism, that's affecting sympathetic outputs relative to blood flow, kind of all these things. So if we change that though, and we see that the signals aren't as clear, we take something that's usually like a nice tight rhythm, where's my camera, a nice tight rhythm, and then we start to expand it. So it's almost like if you have somebody where, like in your home, if your thermostat isn't sensitive enough, you might have it set at 70 degrees, but it might be like 74 before it kicks on to cool it down, or it might be like, you know, 65 before it starts to warm it up. So you see this bigger fluctuation in what can happen before the sensor kicks in and solves it. So for a lot of people that have POTS, we do see where, not only baroreceptors have a problem with having quick sensitivity, that we'll see that relationships of the PVN or the paraventricular nucleus will also have a harder time with all of it. So sleep sensitivity starts to change. Hormone regulation starts to change. Glucose is a little less stable. pH is less stable. And then our ability to control our thermostat is less stable. So today we, we were just talking about this in the office with someone who was noticing that yesterday... What's happening, like, you know, we get hot and then cold. So we look over, sweaty, and then blanket, sweaty, blanket. And, like, trying to manage that was hard. And she's like, is it, I'm assuming that the office isn't changing temperature in any major way. And that's not. But as her system is strained or pushed, then it has a harder time being able to manage those. I even had one case years ago that was a head injury where she had a, a slip and fall and had a big extension injury. And she would notice that if she laid on one side, she would get super cold, like in bed at night. Laying on one side, she'd get really cold. But then if she rolled over the other side, she would just take the blankets off and she'd be a pool of sweat. And she worked on this a lot because she thought, well, maybe it was just like the oscillations, but she could reproduce it in one side, one side, and she could change it back and forth, which is really interesting. And it's a really, that was like a big clue that solidified and stamped into my world how important it is 
to look at the way that your your body is able to signal to your brain, not just in feeling your body, but being able to control all these automatic outputs, including temperature regulation, which was a big uh, a big eye opener for me early on in in my professional life. So um, the question is, can you help people? Yeah. If you can solve for the underlying, a lot of the heat intolerance stuff goes. It's actually really fun to watch because it's cool to see people getting back outside again, being able to sweat, being able to enjoy the sun. But there, there is some, like some behind the scenes of like what is causing that that becomes helpful to actually be able to solve it, rather than saying I'm just going to target the heat part. My integrative practitioner thinks that I have pans, which leads to pots and epilepsy. I'm not sure if you know about pan and pandas. It's not well recognized. Yeah, so these are um, post strep types of syndromes where we just see the strep goes up into the basal ganglia, which is what I was describing earlier. And that's why we see these changes in the movement disorders. It's not different from what we see with different types of clonus or different types of choriform movements or, but we're doing a really, we're, we're doing a disservice for people because we're not explaining it very well and differentiating it from kind of the common things and giving them their own their own language, their own diagnostic criteria, their own inclusionary and exclusionary criteria. So I think that that's really important. That's part of why we talk about POTS in this way is because we want to say, we got, we got to not go from symptom to treatment. There's this middle part that is the most important part where we symptom is like, you should talk to somebody about this or something up. And then that should lead us to like, what is going on? What is the mechanism? And in that mechanism, then opens the door to the matching treatment, right? So there, there's this linear feature that we're skipping in mechanism part, and we're going symptom straight over to treatment without knowing what the mechanism is in between, which is going to cause us to miss a lot of times. So sorry I'm taking that out of order, um, but I think that's really important because it persists not just in PDS or POTS, but in this whole world of things that you can't see well on an imaging uh, file, you can't see well in blood work, but it exists in a ton of people. All these people with concussions and whiplash and injuries and viral injuries, all this stuff where these people where people on this stream, they're just getting kicked to the curb and there's absolutely no reason for it. So I've got a little bit of passion for that and I apologize.